and your local elected officials are helping to implement this insanity, and yet they are quick to deny that these such ideas have their origins at an international level. And they accuse me of wearing a tinfoil hat and hearing voices. Well, here's a voice I hear. Once again, Maurice Strong said at the UN's Earth Summit, quote, isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized nations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? And that is the true agenda that we face. But how do you remove people from the land? Well, there's many tools in place to stop human activity and grow the wilderness. Here's a few. Deny grazing and water rights on public lands. There are, uh, it becomes more difficult and more expensive to run the farm or the ranch, and eventually it'll go out of business and the land reverts to wilderness. Lock away natural resources by creating more national parks. It shuts down the mines, and they go, back, go, go out of business, and it goes back to wilderness. Call every mosquito-infested swamp and occasional mud puddle a wetlands, and ban any development around it. Invent a spotted owl shortage and pretend it can't live in a forest where timber is cut. Shut off the forest. Then when no trees are cut, there's nothing to feed the mills, and then there are no jobs, and they go out of business, and in fact, whole towns die. And it goes back to wilderness. The governor of Maryland is enforcing an agenda, without a vote by the legislature, by the way, executive order, called Plan Maryland that will lock away over 400,000 acres of land, banned from any development. One of the key provisions is a policy to ban septic tanks as a means to protect the Chesapeake Bay, even though there is no evidence that septic tanks do any damage whatsoever. The only result of that ban will be to make it impossible to live in a rural area. Getting people off the rural lands and into the cities is the real purpose, not environmental protection. The Wildlands Project comes in many names and many programs, wilderness areas, comprehensive land use, bikeways, greenways, heritage areas, land management, rails and trails, open space, wolf and bear reintroduction, conservation easements, and many more. Each of these programs is designed to make it just a little harder to live on the land, a little more expensive, a little more hopeless. In reality, the process is simply hurting people off rural land and into the human habitat areas of cities. And that leads us to the second path, the sustainable development called smart growth. They put a line around the city and they tell you no growth can take place outside of that line. Urban sprawl, they say to Stanford. They refuse to build more roads as a ploy to get you out of your car and into public transportation, restricting mobility. New highways, they say, are feeders to new development. They even stop the widening of existing roads for the same reasons. So roads become overcrowded and gridlocked, and they blame development. Their new ploy is to force cars to share the road with bicycles, the complete street, they call it. They're so good at these terms. They believe that the harder it becomes for you to drive your car, the more likely you will just give up and take public transportation or ride a bike. In many smart growth cities, new apartment buildings now have no garages and parking lots. We don't want any stinking cars here. Smart growth creates an unnatural restriction on space inside the controlled city limits. So what happens? There's a shortage of housing and prices go up. That means also that populations must be controlled because now there's a shortage of land. That's why kind, compassionate environmentalist Dr. Jacques Rousseau said, quote, in order to stabilize world populations, we must eliminate 350,000 people per day. Sustainables call for an 85% reduction in human population. Now, I made arrangements with Bill when we're done here today as we walk outside, there'll be containers of Kool-Aid for you there. I want all of you to drink and do your patriotic duty. And I assure you, there'll be no environmentalist in line in front of you. 85% reduction in human population. How are we supposed to do that? 
Do we use the proven success of the Chinese population uh, control methods of forced abortions and sterilizations? The Chinese, I can tell you, are big supporters of sustainable development, and I'm sure they're anxious to share some ideas on how to get rid of Americans. David Brower of the Sierra Club said, quote, childbearing should be a punishable crime against society unless the parents hold a government license. One sure way to cut the population is to control food production, and I warn you now, beware of the term sustainable farming. Sustainable farming is not organic or natural farming. Sustainable farming is a political and economic control of food production and land use. According to Sustainable's doctrine, quote, a sustainable community is one who provides all of its own needs for air, water, land, food and fiber, and energy resources within the confines of its own site. You don't have cars, so you can't get out of town. Nothing is brought in. Everything that you're going to live on is right there in the community. Do you like bananas? Kiss them goodbye, unless you can grow them in your own little community. So, in a smart growth community, farmland is inside what is now called an urban growth boundary, or a UGB. The use of the now limited farmland is called a food shed, or a food circle, and is tightly controlled by what essentially becomes community-owned farms, Chinese agrarian village. And farming practices can only follow strict guidelines set down by government bureaucrats. They can control not only how you grow the crops, but what crops you can grow. Once again, the only result can be food shortages, higher prices, and sacrifice. That will certainly lead to an urgency to reduce populations. Through comprehensive development plans, energy and water use is tightly controlled, and individuals are being forced to live in denser communities that take up smaller tracts of land per housing unit. Planning advocates and government bureaucrats are forcing such planned communities across the state and the nation, and those plans put severe control on private property. The fact of the matter is, there can be no private property in a smart growth community. The third way of sustainable development inside the human habitat areas, our cities and our towns, government is steadily being controlled by an elite ruling class called stakeholder councils. These are mostly NGOs who, like thieves in the night, just show up to stake their claim to enforce their own private agendas. They attend all these public meetings. In fact, they're usually the only ones who do. Real stakeholders, the people who actually live in that town, are ignored. The function of legitimate government, elected government, within the sustainable system is fast becoming little more than a rubber stamp to create and enforce the dictates of these councils. It is the demise of representative government. And the councils appear and grow almost overnight. You'll find watershed councils that regulate human action near every trickling stream and river and lake. Meters are put on water wells. Special action councils control home size, tree pruning or removal, even the color you can paint your home or the height of your grass. Historic preservation councils control development in downtown areas, disallowing expansion in new, in new building. Once the councils are established, it becomes nearly impossible to discuss issues with your elected representatives. Instead, they will automatically refer you to the proper council or administration or department run by unresponsive appointed hacks armed with their own political agenda. Regional governments are driven by the NGOs and stakeholder councils with a few co-opted bureaucrats thrown in to look good. These are run by non-elected bureaucrats that don't answer to the people. As I said, elected officials become little more than a rubber stamp to provide official approval to the regional government. In Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Chattanooga Area Regional Council of Governments, for example, consists of at least six alphabet agencies of appointed bureaucrats. On their own, they have applied for a $2.5 million grant from the federal government's Sustainable Communities Regional Planning Grant Program. To comply, 
Each participating government must sign a memorandum of agreement to develop a shared vision and to develop livable communities and all that that applies, all the strings attached to force them into sustainable development policies. The people of Chattanooga have no idea that this has been done and they have no say in the outcome. 16 counties and all of the municipalities that they contain will be constrained by this grant application and the 40-year regional plan it produces. Yet just these bureaucrats did it on their own. These non-elected councils fit almost perfectly the definition of a state Soviet, a system of councils that report to an apex council and then implement a predetermined outcome. Soviets are the operating mechanism of a government-controlled economy, the exact opposite of our constitutional republic. And the fourth path to sustainable development, as I mentioned, public-private partnerships. You hear the propaganda of the public-private partnerships nightly on your television as their commercials just keep telling you, go green, go green. The truth is, there would be very little legitimate green industry if not for the billions of dollars in grant money shelled out in the partnership to develop alternative energy schemes. In fact, wind energy may well be the least sustainable and least eco-friendly of all electricity options. It probably requires more energy to manufacture, haul, and install these monstrous windmills with their transmission systems than that windmill will create in its history if the wind's blowing and it's turning. Yet the nation, in the name of sustainable development, is investing everything in our future to enforce windmills over real energy producers. Alternative energy amounts to less than 1% of our energy needs. And for every green job created, two in legitimate industry are lost because of green rules and regulations. America has now discovered that it has a near infinite amount of shale oil in literally every state. Rather than celebrate our good fortune to reduce gas prices and eliminate dependency on foreign oil cartels, the sustainablists are rushing in a near panic to block the drilling of shale oil. They will do this everywhere prosperity pops up, everywhere alternatives pop up to their plan, they will rush in and work to stop it in the name of protecting the environment. Moreover, recent government reports show we have more than two trillion barrels of untapped oil under American soil, untapped and banned because of sustainable policy. And now, there is a new kind of corporation being developed through public-private partnerships. It's called benefit corporations. Imagine a legislated brotherhood of business where favored businesses get to go to the front of the line for permits, licenses, and opportunities merely because they agree to advance the principles of sustainable development and Agenda 21. Six states already have benefit corporation legislation. Hawaii, Virginia, Maryland, Vermont, New Jersey, and New York. And five more are in the process of making part of their state corporate legal systems, including California, I'm surprised they weren't first in line, Colorado, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. This policy will destroy free enterprise and guarantee that we cannot stop Agenda 21.